Welcome to the Arena Decklist Podcast. I'm Jerry Thompson, and Brian Gottlieb is currently on a flight, multiple flights. He'll be gone for a long time, maybe, probably. So, I, I want to say that I went ahead and recruited a special guest, but that's not true. They just offered up their services, uh, which is great, because now we actually have a podcast this week, and I am joined by the one, the only, the legendary Mason Clark. What is up, Mason? Nothing much. Happy to be here on the show. You know, I listen every week, and so it's going to exciting to come on. And uh, it's it's kind of cool. We get to talk about the bands, which is the most exciting time ever, you know. And so I'm excited to talk about all this sort of stuff and uh, maybe a little modern, too. You know, I heard there was a DreamHack tournament this past weekend. I did hear that. I didn't really look at it, but I don't know. Maybe yeah. you have more information than me. Yeah, I won. So that was pretty cool. Um, but nothing too big. You know, I, I wouldn't look either. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah, no no big deal. I, I was going to get to the band's last, if that's cool with you. I'm down. Why? Let's have dessert at the end. You know what I mean? Yeah. So to start, I want to talk about two things. And the first one is that you're, you're like nickname or whatever you want to <laughs> call it. Mason Esports Clark. Mm hmm. What what is the deal? Is that still a thing? Like with Magic moving away from esports, do you want to like differentiate your branding at all? Like now you're at a DreamHack tournament, which is you know esports related, right? And you happen to win that event. Like, is there a correlation there? Like, what's going on? All right. So back at the beginning of Hogak Summer, I had a feature match, and in the feature match, it was a team event, and they had everyone's names, and for some reason, they put my middle initial in the name, which was also which just spelled my Twitter handle, Mason E. Clark. And Dom tweeted that uh, the E stands for esports. And it got like a bunch of like a ratio or whatever. And so I like mm. made it the joking thing. Like, you know, like people do like Mason and Philly or whatever for the tournament. I did that and I was going to change it. And then like people kept saying, hey, are you esports or whatever? And they thought it was really <laughs> funny. And it's I was like, like, well, <sighs> well, I am magic. And I heard that magic is esports. So, yes. Yeah, exactly. And, and so it was like. Yeah, nope, I'm that. And so <laughs> it, it just never went away. And so uh, after my account got uh, poofed because of my Mux tweet, I, I removed the esports from my name in the hopes that people would forget. But people this weekend uh, still were like, oh, esports, how are you doing? And so I think it's just part of me now. I, I think I'm just stuck with it forever, which is oh. fine. There are worse things to be stuck with. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I took it as like uh, if I speak your full name, it must include the esports, but people are just calling you esports straight up, like like it is a nickname. Yeah, exactly. Where it's like you know, some people be like, "Hey, Mahoen," you know, like they go by your last name. Yeah, they just love esports, and so uh, and it's also funny. There, you know, I ha I have not met many Masons in Magic. There, there are definitely they, we're out there. There are dozens of us, but uh, it's not like there's a real problem when we're at dinner and they're like Mason and three of us turn our heads, you know. <laughs> so, right, right. It, it's a uh, it's just a weird little occurrence. All right, the second thing is uh, you need to get a new promo code. Oh, yes. So I, I'm in the works on that, and I, I got I got some a couple here lined up, and I want to hit you with one and kind of get your live response. Are you ready All for right, this? All right, well, let's, let's go over the first one first. Okay. The, the current one. Code is 62 and single. Correct, yes. How? Why? Also, also are you legit 62? So I'm like six one and like a couple of change or whatever. But so the answer is no. So the answer is no. But on Tinder, I'm easy <laughs> six four. I mean, it's just not a problem at all there. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, no, I don't know if you've been on the online dating game, but exaggeration is really important. Uh, mm. It's kind of like magic testing. You know how like if you test for an event, you want to make sure that you oversell your matchup. Yeah, uh, absolutely. same thing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no one told me that. No one told me that. So like I, I just went through a breakup, right? And. Mm -hmm. I was on some of the dating apps. I really don't like them. And oh, it's um, awful. Yeah, maybe that was it. Maybe I just wasn't exaggerating enough. Yeah, you got to exaggerate a little bit because you got to kind of sell yourself. You know, you're great, but they don't know you yet. So you got to get them in on the door. And uh, for some reason, height is like a genetically, you know, everyone thinks height is awesome, whatever. But the reality is, is that that was a, a TikTok meme going around at the time that I did it that I guess like no one on Magic Twitter new and they all thought I came up with but mm. it was this meme where it would be like girls would be like I just don't understand why other girls hate fight club or whatever and they they would say things like single by the way you know and stuff like that <laughs> and so guys started doing it and they'd be like and like the one I did was like you know like 
Gilmore Girls really did change a generation, 6'2 and single, by the way. And so I made that joke when I was on uh, Mebo stream once, and a bunch of people really liked it, and they, they just latched onto it like they did esports. And so it just kept perpetuating, 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 and then I leaned into it. And now I have a partner in everything, so it's a little awkward at times. But, uh, you know, the, the promo code's there, and it has a lot of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, like, recognition like people really know that code and they tell it to people so uh enough to the point where i'm bringing it up now exactly yeah so it, it's done a really good job of uh getting people to say my code instead of the more popular people you know yeah so uh <laughs> it's uh it's kind of cool in that sort of sense but now that you know i have a partner six two and single does come with some uh hurdles but it's okay you know we're, we're working through those yeah, you're trying to figure out a solution. Uh, mm -hmm. Gilmore Girls is tight, by the way. So, Oh, it, legitimately great show. I, I actually did watch that show when I was growing up and stuff. And uh, I think a lot of who I am as a person and jokes and stuff come from that and Seinfeld. So, I could see that. Yeah. So, I want, yeah, I, I what's, I what's the new code? What's the new code? All right, so I got a couple, but this is the one I'm leading with. It's 6-2 and Dreamy. Because I have to change my code every three months anyways. Mm, so I was okay. like, oh, you see, I got like the the single thing, the dream, dream hack. I thought it was kind of good. The other one is please use me. But I, I that one, you know, just doesn't quite come <laughs> off the same. <laughs> That's a really good code, though. <laughs> and honestly, see, I like that it got that reaction from me. I didn't think that one was going to hit. So uh, also, I, I think please use me as the one I'm going to send over today to man traders. I actually need to message them. It's on my uh, notes to do today. So I'll throw those two at them. And if they let me use please use me, then uh, hopefully that one will be live. And you can go to man traders and use that code to get 15% uh, off your first two months. I I can just in 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 my head I can just see whenever you post a thing where it's like and use the code please use me like your partner is gonna immediately respond with like the eyes emoji <laughs> like yeah. that, every time like that will happen I'm sure of it I am positive too but you know it's all so right added bonus I don't know yeah exactly yeah 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 it's it's all fun and games around these parts and so you know we're like a good meme here oh man uh it's it's really sad that i don't know you would just have to change it every three months and i don't know i, I feel like that one is both really good and that you kind of have to use it first now that it's like out in the wild right like someone's just gonna steal your code yeah we know tandy's coming in here you know he's doing whatever he can so i've got to make sure i can get him before him i don't i don't know that he listens to podcasts honestly sure that's fair who would who would come after the code though? That's the real question. We all have our answers in our head, but <laughs> no. Well, so as much as I don't think that Todd necessarily listens to the podcast, I have been surprised by the people that have told me that they do. Mm. So, right, can I get a little insider scoop if you don't mind sharing? Who was the one you were most surprised by? Uh, I don't. And I why don't was know. it PB? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to remember if. He ever did i don't think he did but like it, at some point when i think it was just uh majors and i doing the podcast and we were on testing team with like Meguchi, uh, he was just like very confused by the idea of a podcast he was just like okay so i listened to like two people talk like why would i do that instead of literally anything else you know mm -hmm. and then fast forward i don't know six twelve months later or whatever i just see Meguchi at some tournament and he comes up to me he's like hey uh, I started listening to podcasts because of like this thing that is not related to you or whatever. But then like, remembered you had one, I listened to it and I, I actually like it. It's like, not bad. I was like, okay, cool. Like we, we take those, but it's like, you know, why would someone who is routinely top eighting pro tours, listen to a magic podcast that is primarily about like trying to help people. It's like, I, I think he's kind of got it covered, you know, he doesn't necessarily need our help, but uh, yeah, just stuff like that would happen occasionally. That's fair. I, I'm always surprised by sometimes the things that Minguchi needs help with. So maybe you're doing more than you think, you know. Uh, when that new game, Marvel Snap, came out, he didn't know what it was. He thought it was a movie promotion they had sent to him for some reason. And so he saw me tweet about it. And he said, should I tweet about the promotional stuff they sent me? So, you know, <laughs> maybe you're doing more than you think. <laughs> fair point. Fair point. Okay, so outside of the nickname and the promo code, which I do think tell folks a lot about you i don't know just 
who are you as a person? What is your story? Like, what are you doing in Magic? What's going on? Well, let's see. I have been playing Magic now. I so my girlfriend at the time worked in LGS and it was Gate Crash, so I did that pre-release. Cool. And then I played Magic kind of casually locally until I want to say it's War of Devastation. It was I remember my first event where I was really going to try. It was the week where they didn't ban the Helicat combo and then they banned it on Thursday. And so I was in a mad dash to get a deck. Uh, so whenever that is, that is the start of the esports era, I guess. I, you know, I've been playing and I, I do I write for Card Kingdom and I do my own podcast to try and help people improve at magic and really focus on taking that step from the local level to like the next thing. So like, you know, your IQs, your energies, things like that. And when it comes to like magic, I'm really just, you know, I love playing. and I love competing and I love working on improving stuff. And so magic's kind of this like endless thing where I can put so much effort into and I get more out of every time, you know, with diminishing turns a little bit, but like there's still so many things I need to work on and improve on that uh, it's kind of this great like hill I can always climb. So that's kind of me and magic in a lot of ways. Well, I mean, feel free to promote the podcast and actually say its name, you know. Yeah, I, I figured I'd do it at the end, but I'll double dip, you know, I'm down. Uh, Constructed Criticism is the name of the podcast. We actually have a really exciting episode this week. We had Kellen Pastor come on. He talks about playing tier two decks and kind of the advantage of that. So I'm really excited for people to hear that one. Uh, and that I think actually will probably come out this Saturday. So it's really uh, it's an exciting time <laughs> for a bunch yeah. of cool podcasts this week. No, that that's cool. Uh, Kellen's one of those people that was just like a silent crusher, right? It's like mm -hmm. you don't necessarily know his name unless you're looking at who finished in like top eight, top 16 and like constantly remember the people's names because – didn't do a lot of self-promotion or anything, but like ended up platinum, I think, before all that stuff went away. Yeah, he did end up platinum. I mean, he suddenly crushes it all the time. Like when the SCG con came back uh, in the fall, you know, he brought top eight playing the money pile deck that first weekend. Uh, it was kind of, I guess it was the second weekend. I had one week on a motor results. But yeah, you know, he just kind of comes in and crushes it all the time and goes back to doing his thing. Yeah. Kind of hang out with his friends, which I respect a lot. It's awesome. <laughs> you know, I mean, if, like there are there are definitely like healthy and unhealthy ways to engage in magic, right? And mm -hmm. I think just like playing certainly, you know, you can take it as competitively as you want and invest as much time as you want, but like do it in a healthy manner. Like when it starts feeling like a chore or whatever, maybe that's time for a break. But like when you get to just show up every once in a while and win the tournament and then go back to your life, like that's gotta be the most healthy relationship with magic possible. It's gotta be, yeah. It's it's also the sickest, too, because you're just kind of like, yeah, I came in, did my thing, played my deck my way, and then, uh, you know, I'll be back in a couple months when I want to do it again, you know, whatever. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to get, like, 5K or whatever, so I came to this <laughs> Magic Tournament. Yeah, I had a bill come up, and I was like, well, time to hit up the old DreamHack. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's talk about that. So DreamHack Dallas was last weekend. I, I was, like, watching some of the backpack coverage and mm -hmm. just kind of, like, getting a sense for, you know, how, how many people were there, how they enjoyed it and everything. Like, do you have info for like how many people were in the tournaments and like what the structure was and stuff like that that you want to share? Yeah. So I believe it was about 230, 240 people. We had some last minute registrations because it was online registration, but it was, you know, melee sometimes goes down for a minute or whatever. And so they had, we had a little bit of people uh, flustering in the last minute and, Besides that, it was eight rounds of Swiss um, and then cut to a top eight. And they had room for probably about 500-ish people, uh, realistically, with side events and stuff like that. So it seemed like, you know, everything was running pretty well, like smoothly-wise. That was all going great. And people seemed to be having a good time. Cool. But it was definitely, I expected it to be much more like an SCG back in 2018, 2019. And it was much more kind of like a, uh, you know, I don't know, like a, bigger 5k locally you know what i mean but. yeah so, something that is you know it's run on or it's run by like a reasonable org but maybe not something with the amount of reach that scg has where it's like well if scg is holding a tournament like probably everyone is gonna see it you know yeah that, that's that's very true i i guess in some ways part of the the trick like the reason i got tricked was the scg dallas which obviously has the scg name we just mentioned i believe someone said that one was like just over a thousand people and so I thought, well, you know, a lot of people fly in, but Dallas is a big magic community, so they'll probably all come out. But I don't know. 
Well, I got to imagine that it being held at DreamHack, where DreamHack requires like purchase of a badge to even get in the doors, that that might dissuade some folks. And also, I mean, DreamHack is certainly part of Magic Organized Play now, but I don't think that people are necessarily used to that. So they might not be looking at those channels for like the events that are coming up or whatever. But uh, we were talking before the show and you mentioned that they gave away vouchers for like the tournament entries and stuff, which I think with that not being heavily publicized, it's like, well, I have to pay like, you know, 80 for a badge or whatever. And then like 50 to get into this event, like that's a big entry fee versus like, you know, the entry fee basically didn't exist is what it seems like to me. Yeah, they, they kind of waived it with their vouchers on Melee, if you had registered. So, like, you know, giving you $50, and it was, I, th- I think it was 50 to enter the hall. I'm not actually sure. I was a invited person to DreamHack's full disclosure. So, I'm not exactly sure on the prices. But, you know, they kind of, they covered the cost of the event. And I think that was kind of their way of being like, hey, we get that this isn't what y'all are used to. You know, let's try our sound see what we can do. Which, you know, like, if... If everyone had done that, that would be, uh, you know, everyone in the tournament played Magic, that would have been a pretty huge thing for us. But yeah, I think so too. Regardless, it wasn't kind of shared. Yeah, so that that all went well. And relatively speaking, the the only thing that was kind of awkward was we didn't have a um, like a, a sound speaker system. We just had like a judge that had a megaphone or whatever, <laughs> and he he ended up just using his voice after a couple rounds of people dropped. It went really smoothly, actually. Like I think the longest around went over was like twenty minutes, and we kind of just breeze through day one. And then top eight is a little bit of a different story, which we will get to in a second. But uh, all in all, the the main event and everything went really well and really smoothly. And uh, everyone was super helpful with everything. And the judges and the DreamHack people were all very accommodating to like both me and people I know going around looking for stuff, trying to figure out how this whole thing is going to work. Cool. What what sort of like side event things did they have going on? Like if you bust out of the main or if you didn't necessarily want to play modern or the 10K or whatever, what else could you do? So they had modern and pioneer. Um, and I believe they actually tried to do legacy, but behind the scenes story, legacy didn't fire and the mill player and top eight. That's why he entered the main event is they didn't have enough legacy players. Uh-huh. But they were doing modern and pioneer. They were firing those like every three hours. Basically, they were little three rounders with tickets much like a gp and their prize wall actually was pretty good like i was able to get a secret layer after playing uh just one three rounder on friday and then they had boulder gate pre-releases i think kind of in a very similar spot where every five hours they fired one of those off so i guess it was only four of them but they did four pre-releases for boulder gate which cool. was really cool and i think they actually did a draft of boulder gate but don't quote me on that i was a little lost in the sauce on sunday but i believe someone said they were drafting boulder skate yeah, I th- so I was at uh, Command Fest, and that was basically what was going on, too. It was like you could play in those sort of events, and I, I think it is only draft. I mean, I guess technically you could probably seal deck with it or whatever, but the people that I talked about all, all referred to drafting it. So Awesome, yeah, and those people seemed to have a good time, and they had that, and they had um, Commander, they had, sp- they had space dedicated to, like, there were like empty tables, which was very clear. Like, hey, do you want to play Commander with like you know CGB or somebody? Play cool. them over here, and then they had firing pods in case like you know you wanted to play for a little bit of stakes and a little CEDH, I guess. And then they had how to play Magic setup, which was actually great. I, I saw a bunch of kids and adults and people kind of walk by, get a little interested, and then sit down and play. And I don't know how many of them actually converted it or will convert, but they had those. And I I watched one because I was a little curious, like. I wonder how this person's teaching and they seem to be doing a really good job of like walking through it and answering it and not bogging people down, which is what I'm always so anxious about. You know, when someone teaches someone to play magic, right. it's like, okay, so right now you're holding a mana, which that's like, no, 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 help them play the game. <laughs> yeah. But, it's like, uh, yeah. It was walk great. it, walk it back a few steps, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let, let's teach them what the knight and the pawn does. And then we'll teach them what a castling is, you know, right. we'll get yeah. there. <laughs> But that was all good, and we had, like, the She Sparks booth. Cedric was there with his uh, Coalesce apparel and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I feel like there's another one whose name I'm forgetting now. But, uh, you know, we had, like, a little bit of stuff, and we were, like, right next to Face Clan, <laughs> which was uh, a... <laughs> I, I didn't get a picture of it, but it was really funny. There was a moment where it looked like She Sparks had the biggest line in the room, and then you realize it's because they're next to Face Clan. Mm. And it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> but yeah, it was, uh, it was cool. It was a lot of really cool stuff, and it it did kind of feel like they're like, Hey, this is our first run at like, these are what the GP equivalents are going to be. 
and we're trying to make these things like things that you go to, you play some magic for some stakes, but you can also have like a fun weekend doing other things if that isn't what you want and not make it so focused on having to be the tournament or bus, which felt like older GPs were a lot like and newer GPs were becoming more like the command fest, you know, and right. I think it's good to have a little bit of both. So if you're a little spikier, you have these. And if you, you know you love commander and just want to only do that for the weekend, then the command fest is great for you there. Yep. So. Well, you went there to play modern. You have been playing Money Pile for a while, so the four color Omnath Urian thing. And not surprising to see you run it back, not surprised to see you do well, but where is your head at in relation to like that deck, how it sits? Uh, would you consider ever playing anything else, or are you just like doing too well with this thing? Do you think it's like by far the best deck? Like, what's up? So I think it is probably the best or second best deck on a weekend. I think Living End is the other deck that I think Money Pile and Living End, and you can put Elementals in here if you want. I think Elementals is just another way to metagame the Money Pile Mirror. Um, I think those are the great decks in Modern, and there are a bunch of good decks. So I think there are going to be weekends where Living End is much better and in places where you can expect a lot of Money Pile, like team tournaments, for example, where like you're going to probably have a more condensed decks that are like you know the better decks and people are going to not have as much problem getting cards then i think decks like living end are much much better but there's still great decks even when that's not the case but i think money pile the four color control build and the elementals deck are the best decks in modern and a lot of it comes down to how much do you want to go bigger and play things like risen reef versus have more wide coverage with more like bolts and counter spells and things like that which is the way that i have leaned and with uh, the Eternal Witness deck. And then from there, there is the subsections of Ragavan versus E-Witness. And we can mm-hmm. go into this if you want, but I am a really big believer on the Ragavan deck is actually just the strictly worse version of the deck. I don't say that lightly. I, I don't normally go around saying strictly worse. <laughs> and things, but I think that the the logic and everything behind playing Ragavan is actually flawed. And you kind of want Ragavan to fix some of your bad matchups, things like Living In, Belcher, etc. But it's only really good if you get in the first turn Maybe the second turn if you have a busted hand with another, you know, hate card and you can get that huge man advantage and get under them. But those are bad matchups are all decks that don't play fair magic and don't interact normally. So having this Ragavan in your deck doesn't do super much unless you mulligan to it. And so it's nice in something like an open deckless format where you know that your opponent has it and has that sort of thing you can mulligan. But in the dark, you can keep a lot of Ragavan hands and then now good matchups like Yawgmoth get slightly worse. Right. And you kind of bleed. Yeah. And then you can't play the Eternal Witness stuff. And Eternal Witness plus Ephemerate is really, that is your win condition against a lot of players. Besides just like, I have more pieces of cardboard. I'll throw more pieces of cardboard at you. You can't throw them back. You die. And so. Yeah, even in the open deck list situation, I don't think people are necessarily aggressively mulligating for Ragavan. Because it's like, yeah, I have, I have a 4060. And if I draw a Ragavan early, then... Hopefully this is something that contributes to me having uh, like a free win or like kind of increases the free win rate of a deck that is mostly reactive. So Mm -hmm. I I get the idea of including it, but it's also like all of your games are going to go to turn 10 and it's not like Regavan is bad on turn five because of dash. I think that that makes it scale pretty well throughout the late game or whatever, but it's it's so low impact compared to all of the other stuff that you could be doing. We, and the other the other big thing, and this is something I, I harp on a lot on Constructive Criticism, my podcast, is that a problem a lot of people have with the Money Pile deck is it's a Yorion deck, right? And it's 80 cards, so it's hard to find your cyborg cards, which in modern is such a huge thing. Um, and you like really need cyborg cards in some matchups. And Eternal Witness, for the most part, my sideboards are always built to maximize that card to reuse my cyborg card. So things like Chalice. Right. If they get answered, it's really easy for me to play a witness, redeploy a chalice. But then things like, you know, dress down, force of vigor, veil of summer. I have cards that I can reuse multiple times. I'm not using things like, you know, a stony silence or whatever that like don't work well with my internal witness or like are one off things. And so I make sure that I can reuse my cyber cards over and over again, which I think is a, a huge selling point for this style of deck. Now, if you draw one and you get like an Eldamage call with your first witness, now you've got a lot of the cyber card and it doesn't take very many of a cyborg card to win if the cyborg card is impactful you know even invoking an endurance and picking it back up on turn three is a line i've done against lots of graveyard decks and it's really strong (laughs) yeah i mean you were only playing one eladomri's call right yes i was only playing one call 
Yeah. So, I mean, the, the distinction between your list is like you, you have counterspell and mm-hmm. that's that was a normal thing. But I think a lot of people have moved over to four risen reefs and then, OK, well, once we have four risen reefs, how do we want to build the rest of our deck? And usually you see like more elementals, more Eldamri's calls in general. And you, then you have less space for, yeah, like the early lightning bolts or the counter spells and stuff like that. And because they have all the Eldamri's calls, then their sideboards are generally like, well, I have a, a Knight of Autumn and a Magus of the Moon and an Emrakul. And like, you don't get the reusability of your sideboard cards with Eternal Witness. So yeah, I think that that is a very good way to, kind of like break down the differences and like pros and cons and whatnot but i've mostly been a proponent of the risen reef stuff basically because i'm not a huge fan of the card counter spell in general <laughs> but you're selling me you're doing a good job yeah I, and i think this will probably i don't know at least for me when i hear you say this it's not surprising because the way i describe it to people and this is really showing my age is that i kind of feel like the elemental risen reef version of the deck is a lot like abzan mid-range you know, and then the the version I'm playing is much more like Sphinx's Rev, where it's about inevitability and really just killing everything, where the other deck doesn't have that super late game, but it can still grind really hard, but it can also go under you or drown you out in value. And you get a little less flexibility in game plans by having Risen Reef in your deck and having all the Illidan recalls, because despite having the one of cyborg cards, A, those can be answered, and but B, you're just your deck has less flex spots where you can find things off iteration and you know, your natural draw steps, and you have a lot of cantripping in the deck. So that is kind of uh, a selling point, I think, to the Elementals deck, is if the matchups where it's good and the cards you have for it are good, you always find one of them, and you always get to do it at least once. Uh, whereas if you're thinking you're going to play against a diverse field where a lot of different things and you're unsure, playing the deck that uh, I'm playing with, like Counter Spells, March for the Lily Lights, that sort of thing, really comes more in handy because you just have a much more diverse answers for the threats that people are going to bring in modern, which people always bring their kind of pet decks to modern tournaments is my experience. So, well, right. I mean, one of the things that Brian and I usually talk about too, is how you can't really predict what a modern field is going to look like because there are so many people that only own one deck, which is completely understandable. I mean, like what, what is the retail value of your deck? For example, it's like over (laughs) 2k, right? I I believe it is over 2k. Yeah. (laughs) Hence the name. <laughs> yeah, it's ex- it's an expensive deck. It's not it's not cheap. And you're and not even, going up too. Yeah, and you're not even playing the reg bands. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's like you you can never really predict what you're gonna play against. I think your point to team tournaments where it's like, well, now you have three people who need to build one modern deck. Between them, they are likely going to be able to play whatever they want. So it is far more likely that you consistently see like tier one decks in that seat versus like, well, we recruited Jim and Jim only owns Merfolk. So Jim is playing Merfolk or whatever. It's like, that's rarely how it ends up. Yeah. There's also the whole maximize, like, what are you maximizing your weekend for? Like, you know, if you're playing like a per tour and invitational, I might be more down to play elementals because I expect to play that matchup way more. Whereas going to this weekend talking to people, I was thought maybe I'll play two if I'm unlucky, three mirror slash elemental decks. And so, you know, I'm much more down to be like, well, I want to make sure that, you know, I've got stuff for like this as Miranda deck that spikes popularizing, you know, spikes championing a deck and doing well with it. I think that has some real waves with people, especially when it's exciting, like the time Steve deck. Mm-hmm. So, you know, maximizing for fun is awesome and cool. And I've definitely been there a bunch, but it makes it really hard to medigate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so how, how big of a favorite do you think the Risen Reef version is versus your version? I would take their side if we were playing 100 matches. But if we we're playing 10 matches, I think it can go just about either way. Uh, the, the big thing is if they draw Cavern of Souls and how many Risen Reefs early they draw versus Bolts, then I right. have to answer it. Yeah. So it really comes down to that sort of stuff. Like, I, I've i not lost against Elementals in paper, and I've played it three or four times now. But all the games have been, like, dangerously close. Like, my round one of DreamHack was actually the matchup. And I won in turns, and I won game two because I resolved an Emrakul. And uh, they had fetched down to two and they couldn't find an Omnath. And so I was able to minus a Ren player and minus a Ren and just barely beat them. So, you know, they, they had overwhelmed me with uh, cards for sure, but I was luckily able to steal that one. So it is it is a tough matchup, but it is not unwinnable. And it's also not like, you know, so good that like, for example, I would anyone who wants to play me against Jund, you know, not that I would ever bet on a game of magic, but I would play for dinner 
every day, you know? Like, I would just play against Judd. I'd buy, you know, the whole table's dinner or whatever. Uh, I'll play that matchup as many times as I want. I would never, ever do that against Elementals. So Okay. What is your tournament experience with the deck? Because I, it just seems like every weekend, it's like I see a post from you where you're like, oh, uh, you know, top eight, split this 1K or 2K or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so I started, it's so funny. I, I had saw the deck right before SCG con where Kellen actually top eight with it. And I thought it looked really good, but I was a coward and played a coward's deck with Merc Tide. You know, I just junded it up and uh, had a jund performance in modern. And then after that, Vegas was coming up and I was like, well, I'm going to play this deck. And so I've been playing it, um, basically from Vegas forward when death shadow was the best thing in modern. I played Luris death shadow, for uh, like maybe three weeks or so. And I played one event with Amulet in between there. Um, but basically it's been all money pile all the time. And uh, I think the deck's great. It's just so strong. And my experience with it is that like you get to play interactive games and you also have unfair elements to your deck, which is like a strong place. I think to be in modern where you can both compete and trade cards with people, but also present something that's unfair and while your unfair things aren't as extreme as something like, let's say, Char Belch or Escape Shift, they're still really good. Like, Eternal Witness, Ephemerate, and Removal Spell or Counterspell is something that, like, a lot of decks actually just can't beat. And my experience has just been that, like, you can outgrind anybody, and you don't fold to any one hate card, which is the other huge thing. And as time's gone on, and I've played more and more tournaments, people have started to understand that, like, you can't just bring in, like, two or three Blood Moons against me and slam them. Like, I aggressively fetch basics, I have abundant growth, and I have so many ways to kill a Blood Moon. Uh, in, in a recent 2K, actually, I think I punted by blowing up the Blood Moon my opponent had, and I should have <laughs> left it in play. Which is, like, uh, gives an example. I had, like, only two basics at the time. So my deck doesn't fold really to anything when it comes to hate cards, which is a, a huge problem, I think, for maybe the format at large. But it's a great place to be if you're playing Money Pile. So I, I've just played it a bunch. I, I don't know. I, I keep doing really well with it, and I, I think it's great. And it's it's awkward because it's one of those things where I don't want to be, like, you know, results-oriented too much. But it's, like, at a certain point, I don't know how many more times I can keep winning and stuff and not just feel like, wow, I'm playing the best deck. Like, this deck is so broken. And then I see it do, you know, pretty well on Modo and stuff like that, and those metagames pivot and shift a lot more, and we see things like Elementals rise up. In paper, it's just... It's so, so good. Yeah, I mean, I imagine that there's not much of a reason to try and, you know, switch, play something else when you just continually win with it, too. And it's maybe it would be different if it's like, well, I won, but like that tournament felt like a lot harder and maybe it would be easier if I did switch back to Murktide or like this is a good weekend for living end or something like that. But it does not seem like you've come close to having an event like that. I, I had not come close, and I, I try pretty actively to make sure to, like, think about, like, the truth of the matchup and, like, okay, I won, but, like, did I win easily, you know? And I think, like, a great example of this is that Elementals matchup I told you about. It's like, I barely won that one. And so, like, you know, if I think about going forward, I don't want to remember, like, yeah, I'm, like, what is it, 4-0 against Elementals. I don't need to worry about that matchup. That is something I need to be thinking about and thinking about, like, are people shifting towards that and, like, actually adjust for it? And... After playing all these events, it really is just kind of like, yeah, I and mean, if people keep doing what they're doing, then I need to make slight sideboard changes every week and slate you know, a flex slots in the main, like the two dress downs, for example, something mm-hmm. that like I did this week, but maybe I want to play two Eladomri calls and a dress down, or I want to play two endurances because of this, you know, and all those small little changes actually, I think, matter a lot in a deck like Money Pile, despite being an 80 card deck, so... Yeah, it's, it's weird, but it, you also see so many cards and the games go pretty long and expressive iteration lets you see a bunch of cards even just like by itself so it really isn't that uncommon for you to be able to find you know like the the two dress downs in the main right it's like it it does come up often enough to where you still are tuning your deck more or less like it's a 60 card deck yeah and uh in my sideboarding approach uh if you look at my sideboard you'll see that like i have 11 cards for living end which is the one matchup i'm hard targeting because i'm going to the weekend i thought it was the only other deck that can compete with mine that wasn't elementals and i had that quote unquote covered with dressed down main that was as extreme as i was willing to go when i thought i was gonna play it twice and then the rest of it's me bringing in two or three cards and taking out two or three cards and kind of slightly shifting matchups a little bit you know and hoping that that little shift is enough um since my un- my bad matchups, things like Charbelcher and stuff like that, I just can't fix. You know, and if someone wants to bring Charbelcher to beat me, then they're going to beat me, and there's nothing I can do to stop it. You know, not nothing reasonable, at least. <laughs> right. So, 
Well, going into DreamHack, uh, I guess you, you just kind of talked about it a little bit, but it's like, you know, what what did you expect and how how did you tune your deck accordingly? Because I think that that is pretty interesting and is tough for a lot of people to do. And I think with like the, the PPTQs, the like RCQs is what they're officially called, I think, regional championship qualifiers. Like the I think I, I'm not allowed to play in such pedestrian things now that I've won, Jerry. I so, understand, uh... <laughs> but, but your approach, I think, mm-hmm. is helpful for those folks, myself included. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. So going into the weekend, um, like I mentioned, I thought I would play a couple money piles, uh, especially in the later round slash top eight. You know, I think uh, as long as you don't hit things like I keep mentioning, Charbelch or Storm, et cetera, a bunch of Amulet Titan. If you can dodge those things, you'll do really well in the tournament. I expected that. I expected a good amount of Murktide because I think Murktide is the most popular deck in modern, which yesterday's ban announcement would say is true for Moto. And I think that deck is just also kind of fun to play, despite being a little mopey. So I expected a bunch of that, and I expected a bunch of Yawgmoth, because people love Yawgmoth, and I love Yawgmoth. It's my favorite deck to play when I'm just, like, jamming Leagues of Moto just to, like, you know, have some fun and relax. But that deck is just uh, all over the place, and it keeps doing better and better, and it keeps putting up pretty good results. You know, we had two Yawgmoth players in the top eight of DreamHack as well, Mm -hmm. and so that was there. And there was one other deck, that I'm forgetting. Oh, Living End, sorry. And the other good deck I was expecting was Living End. And I was expecting a bunch of that. And that was the deck I chose to kind of hard target. And luckily, I was able to have a sideboard where, like, I can play three Endurances in my sideboard and some Veils. And then those are good against, you know, both Merc Tide and Living End. Same with the one Fluster Storm, where our friend suggested she was like, hey, maybe you should play a Fluster so that if you have this against uh, the Merc Tide players, you can fight over the expressive iterations and things like that as well. Um, and so I played one of those because it's also very good against Living End. And I was able to just find a bunch of cards like Chalice is good against Amulet Titan, which is a bad matchup. Uh, good's a strong thing, but I'll bring it in. And Living End. So I tried to find cards that overlap in multiple places. And then, you know, hard target the one matchup that I think is actively not good and is actively great in the format. The the problem with things like Charbelcher is they just fold to Merc Tide and they fold so many decks. But Living End does not. And Living End is really, really good. And I barely beat my living in opponents in the tournament so but i had 11 cards so i was ready <laughs> yeah how how did everything pan out was the metagame mostly like what you expected or were there any surprises uh the top eight was the most surprising part of things i i played against one mirror one living in two amulet uh a merc tide and then a death shadow player and then i double drew because i went six so and so that was that and then the top eight was i was just surprised how much jun there was but all in all, it was pretty basic. I, I think there were a couple team kills of the Money Pile Mirror early on in the tournament. Like, I beat one, and then I saw another one go to time. And so I, I think that we kind of ended up hitting each other. And then, you know, sometimes you also just lose. It's a hard deck or whatever. But it basically went the way I expected. I did not expect, I'll say this, so many decks that were so linear. One of the things I've noticed about Modern is that we've moved towards more interactive decks, and thanks to, like, the MH2 cards and a little bit MH1 where we have so many cheap and free spells, which has fundamentally changed modern. Like I remember when I first started playing, it's a format that some people hated because they felt like they had no agency and it felt like I spew my hand, you spew your hand and I don't have any cards that can stop it. Nowadays, that's not the case. And at this tournament, there were a lot more decks that were kind of spew our hands and kind of like, you know, come at each other, which I guess is probably a response to decks like me. But that being said, it was basically, I would say that sort of stuff. I'd have to go on melee and actually look. But it was all that sort of thing. And, you know, there were a couple as Miranda decks, like Spike was there and he played it. And there were a couple of Rhinos players who, God bless their heart, you know, they chose to play Rhinos. <laughs> it, it, so uh, a fellow uh, Rhino hater like me and Brian. It is the current Eldrazi Tron. And feel free to take that and use that in your current things. Playing Rhinos in the modern day is like playing Eldrazi Tron during the like Oko Urza days. It's like, you can do it, and you'll do fine sometimes, and there are moments where it's probably pretty good, but dang, is your deck underpowered compared to I love it. I love it. Yeah, I I feel like we may have even come up with that same comparison, but it was like, we can't say this, because (laughs) people, like, Doomwake will just come after us. Yeah, Doomwake said I was going to lose in the the, uh, quarterfinals or whatever when he was contacting my match, and now we're even, you know? Yeah. I was was definitely favored to lose, but come on, Doom, back me up a little bit. Give me a little hype. Have some faith. It's it's not not 100-0, you know? That's right. 
it's not like playing rhinos versus any good deck. It's not a hundred zero. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> it was basically all that sort of stuff. And it was like a fairly normal field. And I think a lot of the last rounds, like, you know, a Merc Tide player got ninth. And I think actually like 11th too. So there were like a lot of the decks that didn't make top eight. It's one of those classic things where if you look at top 16, the top eight looks totally different if like two or three matches win their games. But instead, you know, they didn't. And so now we had like two Jun, two Yogg, Hammer, BTL, Scapeshift, me, and Mill. And, you know, that's kind of a, a weird top eight, I would argue. But uh, still, you know, cool, all things considered. Yeah. Uh, I mean, man, Mill, I know it had like kind of a resurgence because of like Tasha's and uh, Fractured Sanity or whatever, but they, it dropped off so fast. Yeah, the Mill deck. It, do, it has moments where it's really good. And I think part of it being really good was that its hammer matchup was so good. Like hammer's total CMC of the deck was like 34. I think at the time that Tasha's was released. Right. So it's like you resolve that and you're getting someone for like 20 cards. If you watch the top eight, you saw soul Maka actually get milled for like 31 cards off of Tasha's because his Jun deck was just so efficient this weekend. Uh, and you know, that's kind of hard to come back from. Um, but yeah, I, the mill deck, I think just, it gets broken up a little too easily. And it needs, it's kind of like the burn deck, but a little too slow. And then sometimes you draw things like your endurance and you just evoke your endurance and stack it. So the shuffles on bottom and it dies on top. And then now they have to have the surgical. Otherwise you're drawing live towards it again. And I think it's just, you know, it's too much. Plus it's Merc Tide matchup is not very good. And even though Merc Tide is essentially the Jund of the format, you know, it's like a 50, 50 deck. It is still very popular. And it's something that you have to expect to play against in, uh, Despite them adding Ledger Shredder and I think making their deck worse recently, we were happy to see it at the tournament for me. And uh, I think, you know, it's still as oppressive to the mill player. Like the mill player, I think he mentioned playing like a bunch of hammer players, like two or three of them. So you hit those kind of matchups, you're going to do great with mill. And if he had played against me, probably would have also done great. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, luckily Soul stopped him on the other side of the top eight. So we <laughs> got lucky. And then you just get to play against Jund in the finals, and it was <laughs> it was like you were playing for dinner, you know, no big deal. Yeah, it was. That is a matchup I feel very good about. I, I you know, if you watch the commentary, I joked that like the top four matchup against BTL Scape Shift in a lot of ways was the finals for both of us because it was Jund versus Jund on the other side. So we know we're playing against a Jund matchup, and both our decks are so good at stomping out a Jund deck that uh, you know, we just had to kind of played this one to see who was going to, you know, be a heavy favorite in the finals. And uh, it kind of played out that way, despite me stealing the BTL matchup, which is not good. If, you know, you want to be greedy or whatever and try and beat uh, the mirrors, BTL scape shift is a way to really stomp out the money pile players and I the do, elemental players. I do like that deck. It's just like, if you feel like you need, you know, more Omnaths to naturally draw into for certain matchups or just like more interaction in general, then that is definitely not the place for you to go. But it's like you have a small amount of that sort of stuff and you have a lot of the same cards. Like you have Ren, you have Teferi, you have uh, Iteration and everything. And then this top end kill that is pretty hard to deal with. So it's like, yeah, do you want like a very efficient, like I'm going to win the game on turn six or whatever, or do you want more interaction? And I think for the most part, interaction wins out. I agree. I, I think if you know for sure, if you're playing some like, you know, local 1K and everyone there has money pile, I would play BTL Scape Shift instead. But um, for the on average, I think just there are so many decks where you just get, you know, you lose because you had a bunch of Scape Shifts in your hand or Scape Shift light card with BTL and you just couldn't get to the five mana. Despite Ren and Six being, you know, the second best card in modern or whatever and fixing all of our problems and making mana not a problem, making aggro decks not a problem for us uh, as long as we draw it. But you know, you still have to draw her, which is hard to do. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So I appreciate the Rhino's comment, mm -hmm. mostly because it's, I don't true. know, you know, a little, little hot takey, a little incendiary, and also true. And then uh, you just like casually dropped another incendiary comment and moved on, which is that like adding Ledger Shredder to Merktide makes the deck worse. Yeah. So there, there's a little bit of bias here on my end. Against the Money Pile deck, which is where I've been hard focusing, the card that I have the hardest trouble at killing is Murktide Regent. In fact, I have Odawara in my deck still as a nod to like, hey, 
people love Murktide, and I have to kill Murktide. And so Odawara gives me a random out, so a bunch of things, but it plus Red Insects is a good way to lock out a Murktide player in the late game. And so often that matchup is me playing Bingo, just trading one for one with their answers until they can't win a game anymore. So Murktide being seven mana and very often a seven, seven, you know, I can't answer that with any of my cards easily. So by putting Ledger Shredder in your deck, you open yourself up to a lot more of my interaction. And you also play the games out very differently because the way that the Murktide player beats four color is you play some things early. You hope that I get punked by them and lose, but very often I don't. And then you resolve Murktide plus Counterspell. Then you counter my thing, and then we play a game where I try to count. I counterspell check you every turn for the rest of the game, and if you have it, you win. If you don't, you lose. And Ledger Shredder makes it so you need to be casting spells a bunch in order to actually clock me, and it's much easier to kill. And I think that that counterspell play pattern is actually prevalent, at least in my time playing Murktide, um, which I've been the bad guy in testing a bunch with that and played it a little bit back in the day. It's very much often like your bad matchups and even your good matchups come down to threat plus counter spells and not doing anything. So you really rely on your opponent to ledger shredder. But if things are going well for you, you're clocking them quickly, your counter spells make it so they can't effectively double spell, right? So like they're going to use a base spell that doesn't really matter and they play something that does matter. It's like, well, now you're like hitting ledger shredder so you force them to kind of jam into you more. And your clock isn't as good. So it, to me, it kind of reads like, Murktide is your Tarmogoyf under the Jun comparison, and it is also your best way of winning any bad matchup. Like, every deck's ready for a Ragavan, like any uh, reasonable interactive deck at least. So you're not going to cheese people with Ragavans, really. That doesn't happen too much in my experience uh, and my belief in Modern. But Murktide does dodge basically all the removal in Modern except Solitude and Verdicts. And as such, like, it plus Counterspell is a great way to close the game, kind of in a similar vein to, like, you thought sees you play a Goyf and then you play a Lily back in the day. You know, right. it's like that sort of play pattern. And cutting the Murktides from your deck makes it hard to do that. And it makes your Murktides worse. Because a lot of times you would trade a bunch of cards, then Murktide for a little, and then play a second Murktide, grow the first, and now boom, they're on one turn dead. So I I really don't like Ledger Shredder in the Murktide list. I think it's super good in the Shadow list, um, where you're not holding up your mana all the time. But there's such a weird tension and just disconnect, I think. And a lot of the sideboards, I think, are still built to be Murktide hold up mana. And Ledger Shredder, I think, if you're going to do that, you need to switch a lot of stuff. So Yeah, the, I mean, the, the games play out very differently. I mean, I, I I have an inclination to add stuff like Shredder to the deck, and it's like, oh, okay, you get like a little bit more filtering and card selection, and technically it's not bad because this is another sort of like cheap, evasive threat. So... Yeah, it sort of goes with my game plan or whatever, but yeah, for the, for the most part, Murktide is good because it has the high casting cost and dodges all the stuff, like all the endings and marches and and whatnot, and it is kind of awkward to play four of them at times, but you play it because it's, it's Tarmogoyf that actually just has protection from a bunch of stuff, incidentally, too. So it is, it is kind of weird for me to see people play shredder and then you know become sort of like more of a mid-range deck versus more of like a, a punishing delver deck you know what i mean yeah and totally. yeah it's like the the delver aspect is the thing that wins you games not the you know fiddly ledger shredder stuff necessarily but i do think that shredder is good enough to see play but it's it doesn't play super well with murktide itself and kind of just like requires it going into a different deck. And certainly, like you mentioned, I mean, at that point, it's like your sideboard should become much different too, probably because the games are playing out differently. Yeah, especially, I mean, one of my opponents, I believe, played four Ledger Shredders and still had a bunch of things like Jace in the deck on the sideboard. And it's like, well, you're going to have like a really hard time like ever setting things up. And then like you didn't have enough, I don't know, just a bunch of clunky cards that didn't like quite line up with Ledger Shredder and that kind of game plan. And so I think you've got to fundamentally change it. You know, even things like more spell pierces as like medium as it sounds. Like if you're going to try and be reactive, at least make it so it's able to work with your shredder developing early. So I don't know. I I really like Ledger Shredder in decks like Shadow. I think it's actually great in that As Miranda Time Sieve deck. I think not only is it like a card that makes your deck function better, but it just synergistically works. And I think that 
Ledger Shredder needs to be like kind of like WD-40 and kind of greasing <laughs> your wheels and making the deck go more smoothly. And it can't be the backbone. Like you can't be playing a reanimator deck and you're playing this. I got three persist for Ledger Shredder. Let's go. You know, <laughs> like no more need for the face mending. That's that's my uh, take on Ledger Shredder. I, I think it's good, but I think it is also we need to come down and give Ledger Shredder the respect it deserves, which is a lot, but can't do all the work for us. Yeah, I mean, it just it shifts you into more of a mid range deck. And mm-hmm. like Murktide has the ability to do that with like Archmage's Charm and whatnot. But I also feel like at that point, you know, Shredder, especially with stuff like Jace, but even stuff like Charm, that's a little bit clunky. It just means that like the Shredder is not going to be very good in your deck anyway, because you're not going to be able to double trigger it all that often unless you just draw Mistress Bobble every turn or whatever. So yeah. in, in terms of Reanimator... I like it, but again, you can't just slot it into the old Esper list. Like, there was one I saw, I, th- I think I mentioned this, like, last week or the week before, from McWin Sauce that was, like, Ragavan, Shredder, Grixis, and, like, Shredder Thoughtseize, I think, plays very well, like you mentioned with the mm-hmm. Shadow list. And then for the Reanimator deck, it's like, okay, well, now you're super low to the ground and are not doing, like, the fiddly, uh, faithless mending stuff, and, like, you have Tainted Indulgence, which I think is fine, but, like, yeah, your your deck is just very cheap. You're not playing Shredder alongside Counterspell. And I think that all of that stuff makes sense to me. And that deck looked really good. Yeah, I'm a big fan of that deck. And and I like experimenting and seeing how far we can push cards. But I've seen some people do some wild stuff in formats, even like Legacy, where they've trimmed some of their ways to get cards in the graveyard to put Ledger Shredder in their decks at high numbers. And I think you can have Ledger Shredder in addition, and maybe instead of like one in Tomb or something like that, if you're a slower reanimator deck, right? But... Ledger Shredder, I think, can't be doing a lot of heavy lifting because it's just so easy to stop that card. And it has to line up at, like, the right times, you know, so. Right. Yeah, it's a sweet card, though, and I think it is definitely going to stay around, and uh, I think it's going to go in more and more places. I I don't know. I keep mentioning the Time Sieve deck. Have you seen Spike's Time Sieve uh, as Marina deck? I think it's actually quite, like, very close to good, and I think it's a great matchup against me. Yeah, I I watch Spike a lot. Okay. And like big, big respect for what he does, just like constantly pumping out new deck lists and like things that are also innovative and original and cool and like also pretty good. Like he does a lot of winning. People like his decks. They pick him up and he is like changed formats, you know, several times, like just mm-hmm. like altered formats entirely. And like, I don't know if this deck is one of the things that does it, but I don't know, even for the old blue black Asmodex, where, you know, I think Doomwake either like created or popularized or whatever. It's like the old ones. I mean, Spike is doing things much differently where it's like four Academy manufacturers discard that to Cookbook or Shredder. You have four Unearths to bring them back. And then at that point, you're making a bunch of cardboard and then has four time sieves to just then go infinite from a bunch of different board states. And you know, like took the food shell that I think we were all playing as kind of like this mid-range control deck and was like, well, if we just add manufacturers and and time sieve at that point, it's like we can basically just be a full-on combo deck. And one of, one of the things that I really wanted from those decks I thought would make it really good was like, give me something else to do with Daredevil because like, obviously it's very good with cookbook, but it's just blank cardboard and we don't have like faithless looting or anything to to just like loot it away for value so it was like if you don't have cookbook the daredevil's not doing anything but if you had a secondary engine it would be really good so yes yeah, so spike stack just like checks a lot of boxes for me it's like not necessarily something i would want to play but yeah definitely very cool very innovative and i think that shredder in those decks does kind of solve the daredevil problem where it gives you something else to do with the card yeah i think it also makes emery more reliably good which uh I, I don't know. Like people were all about Emery and then they just like quickly moved off of it. And I don't know why, because I love that card and I think it's very good. Yeah, I think modern has so many ways to kill a thing that having an untap, like having to have it untap is kind of a problem right now. But I will say that when it does untap, it's really good. The unearth fixed that problem. And like this deck is really good at putting the Emery into play, like on turn, you know, one sometimes even so. I like it in this deck, and it's the best I think I've seen it since the Oka Urza days, where it was obviously just an unstoppable piece of that engine, you know, and it was great. Yeah, um, but, but like, yeah. They, they they have to kill everything. Like, yeah, you need to untap with it, but it's 
generally only costing you one mana. Occasionally it finds you a daredevil or something to unearth or whatever. So you're getting a little bit of extra value there. And it's just like so cheap. It's like, yeah, you need to untap with it, but it's it's so cheap, so you're trading, like, what, one mana for their Unholy Heat, and then that means that maybe your Asmo is more likely to live or whatever. It's just like, I don't I don't really buy that argument, you know? No, I, I'm, I'm with you. I think this is this is the one deck where I've seen that argument of Emery fall apart, or in past decks, like um, my, my friend Jesse, she did really well with the Breach deck, and it was really reliant on Emery to go off. And you would have to use things like Ragavan DRC in order to like eat the removal spells early in order to stick an Emery most of the time. Otherwise, you're kind of like punk, you like, you know, you kind of put them to the punk test. You're like, you got it or not. Uh, but this deck, I think, does solve that problem and it makes it really appealing. And that's why I'm so interested in this because I think it actually has a lot of the tools. And maybe it's not this build we have right now that's the final one, but I think there's some really interesting stuff. And it's some, one of those things, too, I want to keep an eye on if more artifacts come out in a future set where I'm like, ooh, yeah. That's the thing I need for this deck. Right. So what else was going on at DreamHack? Like Magic was a small part of it. DreamHack's been around for a while. They're esports. Uh, I saw you posting like a, a picture of you like watching CSGO or whatever. So like what else mm -hmm. What else was there that was cool that you liked? So the CSGO was sick. I, uh, My girlfriend and I play a lot of Valorant. And um, we love that, and which is obviously a different game, but it's the you know the new quote unquote CS:GO. So I got to watch that live in person. It turned out to be like it was kind of hard to hear some of the casters and stuff, but it seemed to be this was like the mid year finale for them, and so it was super awesome to watch that. And the fans were so into it; that was awesome. Uh, I watched a little bit of melee. Uh, there was um, like some CRTs that went behind. I watched some Ultimate. I love those games. I love love melee. It, it's really funny. I actually got into melee because of you on humans and magic <laughs> and yeah it's a, a, a side story is i wasn't sure i wanted to keep playing card games you talked about the melee doc i watched the melee doc and went full on into games that's uh i don't think i've ever told you that but that, that's a no that's cool that's cool yeah uh, i love melee it's one of my favorite esports to watch so i was i was a little sad hungry box or somebody wasn't there that i could meet but uh, i get it it's like a smaller thing for them there was that and then there was some other thing that was really oh rocket league i have a 10 i'm sorry 11 and 12 just had his birthday brother uh and they love rocket league and fortnite and so i went and recorded some of the rocket league stuff and they had all the cool you know pyrotechnics and everything and it was so awesome to see that sort of stuff and then they just had a bunch of really cool little booth things and a lot of like creators there like i don't know how much you watch youtube stuff but like when it comes to esports news like jake lucky was there and i got to say hi to him and that was cool and just a bunch of other like if you're big into like the esports orgs like uh, I'm not a huge FaZe Clan member, but like they had a bunch of those people there. And then they had um, the CLG, uh, not CLG, sorry, uh, Team Liquid for Counter-Strike was doing meet and greet stuff all weekend. And so it was uh, it was really exciting. And there's just like all these different things and different games and they that stuff. Oh, and they had a surprise about anime stuff too. There was like a lot of anime merch, which I figured there'd be some, but there was like a whole section that was just like, I don't even know, like those like scrolls that you always see at LGSs, you know, sometimes were like fan like stained glass art of like pain from Naruto was a really cool one I saw where I was like, dang, if I had a place to put that and I wasn't flying back, I would consider it. But instead yeah. I'm walking away. <laughs> did did was it like an an artist alley or was it just like a shop set up a booth? It was like it was almost an art the artist so I I that's the one thing I would say is that the floor seemed a little scattered and I don't know what happened. Maybe something and they got to change it, but there seemed to be like an artist bubble and then another artist bubble. Okay. And so it was kind of like these two sections of the hall. And I also, I kind of did a pass on Friday and then I kind of walked around on Sunday while I was waiting for them to build the stage for us to play on. I, I didn't go super deep into a lot of the, the alley stuff, but it seemed like they just had weird pockets of it. Okay. Um, which maybe had to do with space, but I, I don't know. So the last dream hack I was at, I think was in Montreal and was a, a few years ago. Like it was definitely pre pandemic. And this is, you know, before arena, before they're doing like any magic stuff whatsoever. And like your, your thoughts on it with like all the random cool esports stuff. Like I, I totally echo that, but like there wasn't a whole lot of merch for me to buy except for like from a few specific places. So it, yeah, if there is like, artist alley type stuff like I'm, I'm super interested in that stuff like that stuff is really cool so that's an added bonus for me yeah there was um 
And I went and looked up her comic afterwards. I wish I could remember the name now, but it was a really cool, like, she, she does a web comic on Twitter and she has like, you know, like 2 million followers or whatever, but she had like panels of it and stuff there that you could buy the merch in person, which was really cool as well. So it was cool to see like, oh yeah, there's like all these, you know, things that I have no idea exist that are giga popular and there's a space for those people to go and experience, which is really cool. And along the arena lines, I forgot to mention this, they had an arena tournament going on Sunday which was really funny to hear like the announcers because they had an intercom for them that's like arena round two is about to begin, <laughs> you know? And it's like, oh yeah, I guess people come to this thing to play arena because that's the only way they play magic. That's kind of huh. sick. <laughs> was was that announced or like widely popularized or whatever? I don't, like I knew about the 10K, but I didn't know about this. I did not know about it either. It might've just been a thing where they were doing like, because the magic section was right next to the land party section, which if you've been to DreamHack, they have like a whole oh, yeah. chunk of the room where you just play land. And on Friday, they had like meme music going the whole time. Uh, it was like being in a canister stream. Oh, my and, God. That that was immediately what I thought of. <laughs> yeah, it, it was going the like the the classic, like the dun, 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 like the entire first two rounds of the side event I played it happened. And I thought to myself, if this goes on tomorrow, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> but they had like this some uh, arena thing and it was like kind of by the bathrooms. When I would walk to the bathroom, I would see I'm like, ah, this person's about to blow them out with the wandering emperor, you know, but I don't know what what it was, but they had some event going. It might have just been like, a, you know, a little three rounder, hmm. but it was weird. I don't know. Man, I now I'm picturing like Canister going to DreamHack because he's just like I've been training for this my entire life. You yeah, know, like this this awful music just like blasting in my ears while I'm trying to play Magic. It, oh, it would be so good if actually Canister was, was like the the surprise DJ for it, and he went up there and just puts on this stream playlist. Oh Crowd yeah, goes wild. Oh yeah, just mm-hmm. a, a room full of Canister's mods requesting. Like garbage yeah. YouTube links or whatever. Yeah. God bless him. <laughs> we had a DJ booth right next to where the top eight was playing out. Uh, so we had the headsets like the Mythic Championship with the white noise. And we talked to each other and the judges or whatever. But I could still like I could hear the Kesha and the black pink to my right. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's not bad. But, that I could. Yeah, do. I could roll with that. Yeah, that that was good. And she was she was a really good DJ, too. So when I was waiting to like watch in the like little watch area, that was nice as well. But it was funny where it's like. Oh yeah, kill this love. What a banger. All right, back to my turn. <laughs> <You know. laughs> there was a, a Grand Prix in Detroit uh during Eldrazi Winter where uh this is I think this is where they had the Innistrad escape room. If you remember seeing like, mm, pictures of that. Yes, that was so cool. And for whatever reason, there was just like a concert in the next hall. And it was like it was a real band too. I mean, I want to say it was like Papa Roach or something, but like I don't think it was them, but it was like something on that level where, you know, maybe it's not like a real concert where, you know, people would actually want to go to it or whatever. But it was like a band that people knew of were playing. And it was just like you could hear the music. The walls were like reverberating and everything. And it was like, this is just really weird and like kind of hard to play magic or whatever. Yeah, they actually had a concert in the hall on Saturday night. Oh, Motionless and White, right? Yeah, Motionless and White. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doomwake was uh, posted some videos of it. and A lot of people were saying it was like one of the best concerts they'd ever been to. It was lame. I'm lame and old Jerry, so I was in bed, you know, getting ready for my top eight. But uh, then youngins had a good time with it, which is cool. So no, that's great. How old are you, by the way? I I, w- I want you to guess, and I'll tell you. Twenty eight, but that's only because I think like everyone is twenty eight. I'm twenty nine. Okay, recently had a birthday, so yeah, I got gray hairs, man. Dude, me too. Time comes for us all. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was dream hack. It was fun. It was cool. I'm trying to think. Yeah, the, the only the only thing we haven't talked about is that we did have to wait for the stage to get built to play our top eight match, which they built in the morning of. And uh, they had told us, like, hey, we're going to be on the main stage. tomorrow, So be here at your allotted time. We'll put you on the main stage. And I was like running a little late because of security. And I was like, oh, no. And then like I got then I like, found a judge. And I'm like, <laughs> judge, I, I'm in top eight. I have like two minutes. Where, where do I go? And they're just like, oh, they haven't built the stage yet. And I was like, what do you mean they haven't built the stage? <laughs> I thought we were on the main stage. And so. Yeah. And then yeah, how long did cool. how long did you have to wait around? I be, so my match was supposed to start 10:45 uh quote unquote start. Um I believe Soul started playing the first match at 11:30. Okay. And then they actually made me play my quarterfinals off stream so that they would have time for everyone else's matches. So I waited uh probably an hour and a half. So I probably played my first match at 1 o'clock. So Damn. 3 hours later. Damn. Yeah. Man, you could have gone to the concert, you could have slept in. 
I, the sleep in part's the one I always think about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, they they were supposed to stream like all the matches, right? That that's they streamed they every to. match, but my top, it, but my quarterfinals. Yeah. yeah. Which is mm-hmm. cool. I do like that, but yeah, I mean, I guess you gotta get the stage built first. So. Yeah, a, a little small oopsie poopsie, and I think you know uh, there was some complaint about the lighting, and I it's funny when I was watching on the like plasma to the left of the stage. For like the viewing area, the middle didn't seem as bad as it was when I got home and like went up and pulled up the Twitch VOD to like kind of see what it was like. Yeah, and I don't know if maybe that's just my screen, but they could definitely work on the lighting a little bit to make it a little bit better. But for me, there are so many lights on it where I was like, "Oh, this has got to be well lit," and like you know, everyone's gonna be able to see the cards. So I didn't even think about like when I put my cards in the middle, this is gonna be hard for the coverage. I thought it'd be right. easier for coverage. <laughs> So. Yeah, I mean, that stuff is is difficult, right? It's like there's a reason why there are professionals doing it, or it's just like why people can't take a good decklist photo even. Yes, it's, you know? it's hard to take a good decklist photo. That's true. The upside trick down. Is take it upside down. Upside yeah, down, there I you heard. go. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the schmoove, the blade. <laughs> I'm sure DreamHack would have had it happened, but without Honorog, there would have been way less coverage of this weekend from his backpack stream to helping do the actual thing and taking care of the OBS, you know. And if you watch the finals, you'll even see uh, Spike joke about how Honorog taught me what to do, but he had to unfortunately leave for his plane, so he couldn't stay around for the finals. But, you know, huge shout out to him as well. Yeah, so. ab- absolutely. Just, like, yeah. crushing it and doing a thing that the community desperately wants. And I- I'm very glad that someone stepped up, you know. Yeah, yeah, working all weekend doing it, you know, so many you know? weekends, too. Uh, yeah, <laughs> many. So how how do you feel about the deck maybe like taking a little bit too long or like, you know, it being 80 cards? Like these are things that I've talked about where it's like this is this is all like kind of an awkward experience. And I feel like you're maybe more likely to run into time and stuff like you've played this deck at a bunch of events now have you felt like that's been an issue at all um so before playing this deck i never gotten a draw at a magic tournament that wasn't intentional i have since gotten one draw which i think is unfair i think the judge should have gave us a time extension but whatever that's things here now there but i do think you have to play quickly with this deck and you have to play uh efficiently and you need to shortcut and uh, unfortunately for coverage or whatever, uh, we took our time playing to also make things clearer, which slowed things down. I think in the top four match, especially with us both playing big, uh, you know, scape shift BTL and then myself, either way, I, you do have to play fast and efficiently. And if you're having trouble with that, this deck will lead to more draws with you. And by its nature, it just draws games out. So, you know, you go so much longer, so you got to know when to scoop and stuff and you got to know when you're beat. And you also need to know like, when to close the door as for being 80 cards if you're talking about dexterity i luckily don't have that problem i double sleeve my deck and my i can (laughs) still shuffle it but it is a problem for some people and you know it's a lot a lot of my opponents struggle to like cut my deck or whatever and i just tell them do whatever you need to do you know (laughs) but uh yeah i don't know i think that the deck you do have to play efficiently and fast and you need to be precise and you need to kind of know what you're going to do and what you're going to be fetching up and that sort of thing. And so that's a problem, but a lot of that can be fixed by just playing it some and actually just taking some time to think about what's my worst fetch land? What do I want to get? What, what do I need to have my man to look like? And the pre-planning stuff that you should be doing with other decks, you know, before you make decisions. Right. I think you have to do it with this deck. Yeah. Um, the reps help a lot. And I, I, I think the first example of this is like the old five color zoo deck. Mm-hmm. where it's just like, okay, you know, you draw your opening hand, you you keep, because it's like three lands, four spells or whatever, and then you're like, oh, crap, what lands do I have to fetch? And it's like, okay, this this Heath has to get this, and like this, you know, Marsh Flats needs to get this or whatever, but it's like, you play the deck enough, and it's like, okay, you see your opening hand, and it's just like, all right, this is like Rogren Triome into Forest, like pretty easy, right? Yeah, Rogren Triome, Forest, Breeding Pool, if you do those three in a row, will give you everything you need to be able to cast. Except for counter spell, which if you have that one, you just grab an island. But you know, there you go, boom, you're done. You yeah. mastered it. So, so. That, good, good shortcut. And then, obviously, you know, post board, you're playing against Blood Moon. You might have to like get used to the reps of that. Of like, what basics can you afford to fetch and whatnot? Where, which land do you want the abundant growth to end up on? So like that determines how you sequence things and everything, right? Yeah, my my big secret. That I, that I think I do differently than a lot of people is I aggressively fetch basics 
basically all the time because you do have Omnath to recoup the life you lose, but you do have to find and stick an Omnath for a while for it to actually recoup the life. So I like getting the basics and then having my like kind of middle turns where I develop my mana more tapped because if I have my bigger plays, it's like Omnath and something like that. So the tapped mana doesn't matter as much because I'm regaining life where I'm shocking. I'm gaining two instead of four, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think fetching basics is really good early. And it also, I've had players tell me they didn't bring in Blood Moon because they saw how aggressively I fetched basics in game one. And they're like, well, you're obviously going to do that in game two, <laughs> you know? So, Which honestly might be to your detriment, right? If like Blood Moon is not a big deal for you and you are going to yeah. fetch around it, it's like, I don't know, you know, maybe you can switch up your play a little bit. Yeah, I, I might need to start getting more things, more shock lands. But yeah, you, you have to do that. And I think... Uh, moving your abundant growth on the fetch lands is the thing that you have to do a lot in this deck. Just to actually keep your life total high, because a lot of times you're just like, you can't lose unless that bolt deck has three bolts or whatever. Right. And it's like 1% that they have it, but it's like, well, are you going to risk your tournament for 1%? I don't think so. And so th- that's pretty big. And also having fetch lands stay in play is so beneficial with Omnath, with the deal four mode, which secretly comes up a lot. You know, just a lot of little small things with this deck, but... uh you do have to get good at figuring out where you're going to put things. And like, you know, if you watch the, the, uh, what's the semis in the finals, you'll see that I slow down, taking my time to double check my mana because not having the right mana is the easiest way for you to lose. Yeah. So, you know, one time rounds, take your time, but this time you gotta, you gotta shortcut it and make sure that, you know, you've learned what you need and where you need it. Cool, man. Anything else, anything else you want to share about you? I know you say you're going to, Save the plugs until the end. I mean, we're there. Yeah, we're there. No, no pioneer band discussion. Oh, um, yeah, I mean, we we got like an hour in. So yeah, like, no, you're good. You're good. I, I'm down. Q and D thoughts. I mean, you can share that too. That's sure. fine. Good ban. Uh, expressive iteration. I think the blue red decks are still strong, but now they're a bit more fair. Where before, I think you could just kind of throw cardboard at people and thanks to cards like Treasure Cruise and stuff, you would. And expressive, you would just take over the games, and now you know you get to actually play and grind it out. And I think Winoda, it's not the most fun thing in the world, and pretty oppressive again. Well, pretty good at pushing out other decks that fill a similar space. So it's cool to kind of see that stuff go. And I'm excited to play more Pioneer. That's my quick thoughts on it. I don't know. No, that's 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 good. Uh, I th- I think no one is really surprised by Winoda getting the axe. I think that was probably just inevitable. Iteration is interesting because. They said that they like having the Delve spells in Pioneer, which is not a thing that they've explicitly come out and said yet. And mm-hmm. this is the first format where iteration is actually banned, which is also another landmark. So, yeah, the, I would argue the first of many. That that card is, I mean, may, maybe not, but that card is messed up. I joked about Ren Six being the second best card in my deck or whatever, and expressive iteration is probably the strongest card in my deck i mean not actually but it feels that way when i play it (laughs) you know so that card's nice uh also the risen reef ones usually don't play it so yeah imagine not playing expressive iteration as long as you could that has not been my experience with magic (laughs) (laughs) well yeah i mean now now you know that it's like potentially on the chopping block right like they might be coming through expressive iterations might as well just play them while you still have the chance it's true they gotta take it from my cold dead hands I'll say this, that that's the one thing probably is I hold my expressive iterations forever, like their brainstorms and legacy. And I like in the deck, unless I'm going to miss a land drop, I hold that thing as long as I possibly can. Basically all the time, unless I'm trying to slam the door on somebody. Like if I can find like, let's say a fetch line to trigger Omnath to kill somebody immediately, I'll go for it. But the rest of the time, I'm just kind of like, nah, I got a bunch of answers in my deck. I might need to find the one I need later. So yeah, that I, is one thing I've done differently. Generally, it's just better to develop anyway and like use mm-hmm. the, the card drawer later. So, I mean, I, I doubt you're like passing on turn four with no play with an iteration in your hand, but. Yeah, but if I can do anything else, I try to, you know, I try to juice that card as much as I can. Right. Assuming I only have one. If I have multiples, then it gets a little different where it's like, oh, I don't yeah. want to get clogged up. So, you know, yeah, everything with a grain of salt. But the longer it goes too, the more you get to utilize just getting two spells off instead of like pigeonholing yourself into having to take a land or a cheap card. Oh, yeah. It's so, it's so nice taking two. So it's nice too that you can evoke the uh, pitch elementals from the exile zone. Yeah. It's just a little, little treat. Yeah. It's like your own Mishra's Bobble. You know, you got some zeros to hit. <laughs> exactly all right plug some stuff do whatever you want all right well i mentioned it earlier but uh, i do a podcast it's called constructed 
criticism, you know, like a deck of cards constructed. And uh, we do it each and every week. It's really focused on trying to take that step up from, you know, you're playing your local things to going into the bigger stuff, like an NRG, uh, the RCQs, the RC itself. We focus on that each and every week. And we have a really big emphasis on when to do that and always improving. So I highly suggest checking out that show if you feel you're in that sort of spot. Um, I write for Card Kingdom each and every week. You can check me out there on Thursdays. Uh, it'll be all Pioneer this week. So if you want to hear some more stuff about Pioneer or find some deck lists, you want to check out that. And then I am on Twitter at Mason E. Clark underscore. <laughs> I was wrongly banned by Twitter for making a little hee hee ha ha about Musk. And so now I've lost all my Twitter followers and I've prestiged like it's Call of Duty. So bigger number, better person <laughs> is the joke. And uh, I got I got to grind back up there, Jerry. So, you know. That's where we're at right now. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully this does it. What are you shooting for? Because you're like sub one thousand right now. I uh, know. I'd like to just. I, so here, here's what we're really at. And I'll, this is a little inside baseball. Is that for a long time, a friend of mine, misplaced ginger Derek, would joke that he had uh, more followers and he was a better person. You know, per per the the online joke, bigger number, better person, which is a commentary on parasocial relationships, which is a whole thing we could get into, obviously. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it's all it's all a big joke. And now I, w- I had a bigger number than Derek. So I got to, you know, get him and make fun of him for a little while. And now I've lost it again. And so I just need more followers than Misplaced Ginger. So at the time of recording, I'm going to pull it up right now. I, think- I am too. I'm curious. Oh, yeah. oh wow. Yeah, so he has 2558. Dang yeah. it. He's streaming magic again. He's gaining followers. When he just only posts about e-girls, he loses followers. So I'm at 985. So, you know. I would like a cool 1700-ish, I think is a fair little bump. And then, you know, I'll be uh, just right around Derek's range. And that's all I'm really looking for. So uh, you, it won't be, you won't be the bigger number and the better person, but you'll be like three fourths of a misplaced ginger. Exactly. Yeah. And then from there, you know, I'll grind up again, you know, and I'll, I'll regain it. But, uh, you know, if you ever played Call of Duty, you prestige. And that's just been my Twitter experience. And uh, it's also funny. A bunch of people think they follow me or whatever because I did like the dream hack giveaway and they like the rules were follow and retweet. And some people won, but they weren't following because I think they thought they were following me from before, which I felt bad about. But it was like, well, oh, that's I funny. did put the rules, you know, and I've said to check when I posted it. But, you know, these things happen, unfortunately. You just rules lawyered them. Well, what what if instead of that? I told you that Unfinity is has an official release date now, according to the Wizard Magic thing, as I just opened Twitter. Would that excite you? Are no. you an Unfinity fan? No. But what if I told you it was coming October 7th? Does that change it? I'm sure that there, you know, like you could, <laughs> you could throw a dart at a calendar and a Magic set would be releasing somewhere around there. So Too true, unfortunately. <laughs> Do I get to say that's game? Go ahead, yeah. That's game. Good luck.